The next object we are going to study is called quotient spaces, all right? And there's a reason why students often have a sort of a phobia about this more than any other kind of, uh, you know, operations that you do on vector spaces. The reason probably is because we try to understand or gain some familiarity with this in terms of objects that we already know. The first and the most important thing that you would do well to remember about these objects we are about to study, that is quotient spaces is, they are not objects that should be seen as something similar to objects in the individual vector spaces. You see, when we talked about products, it's true that it was a bigger list, but you would not be faulted too much if you thought that this V1 is after all something that belongs in the vector space V1. V2 is something that comes from vector space V2. So these objects taken isolated in isolation at a time, these are objects after all that look exactly like the parent vector spaces. So we have an idea of what they look like. It's just a list. We're just padding them along and stacking them up together, right? But when you go into quotient spaces or factor spaces as they're sometimes referred to, right? You have to get out of that mindset and try and understand what these objects are, what they look like, all right? Once you understand that clearly, a lot of the results will be very obvious because again, the intuitions that you have about Euclidean spaces will help you, right? So with that sort of a preface, let us launch into this. <clears throat> so as usual, we have a vector space V and we have a subspace of that vector space, which is u, right? Just go by the definitions from the very first step onwards and ask me if you have any doubts about any of the things that I'm introducing, all right? <clears throat> so the first thing I'm going to define is this. already a very weird looking notation and something that we generally say you shouldn't do, which is adding apples and oranges. But for want of a better notation, this is how we will represent this. This is not the common addition. This is a subspace of the vector space V, <clears throat> all right? And this is a vector V sitting inside the vector space big V here. All right. So what is, what is basically being talked about here? <clears throat> what sort of a thing is this? First of all, is this a vector space? Unless, unless V is zero, of course, because this is basically shifted versions of that subspace U. We can belong to U, we will get into that, but if it is in general not so, then this is not a vector space. What is this at best? It is a set, exactly as it looks. In fact, it is called an affine set, <clears throat> all right? So for V belonging to the vector space V, we define V plus U in such a manner. If I just try to draw a sketch for Euclidean spaces, <clears throat> let's take R2 for instance, this is X and Y, and let's say my subspace is this blue line that is U, all right? And Let's say this is V. So what is this set that I've just described to you going to look like? What do you think this set is going to look like here? <clears throat> Parallel, absolutely. So, 
okay, my sketching is not too good, but yep, that's what it is. So this is V plus U. <clears throat> so you see it's a shifted version. The first observation very importantly is there is no one unique V that allows you to define this purple line, right? So you might have chosen this V and your friend might have chosen this V hat and your friend would say, hey, this is not V plus U, this is V hat plus U and you could argue with your friend till Ragnarok without any conclusion. But that is the sort of thing we want to prevent in mathematics, ambiguities, right? So what is it that is sort of missing in all of this? We need some structure with these objects that we are now defining. Because now we want to carry out some algebra with these objects, right? So this is just one set, <clears throat> yeah? But remember, the goal is that I'm going to define V, I'm going to define U, and then I'm going to look for all possible parallel translations of U, which is the subspace. This is just one parallel translation, and in that one parallel translation itself, you see there is quite a lot of bickering going on between V and V hat. Like you might say, V is the best way to do it. So friends say, no, V, v hat is the best way to do it. Now imagine what we are trying to deal with here is an object defined like so, which is now a collection of what exactly? V plus U for all possible Vs that you choose from the vector space V. This is the object we are interested in. <clears throat> now, if this is the object that you are interested in, then what I have just described in the previous line is just a member of this. Is that clear? See, the overall object is this. It's a notation. That's why it's called a quotient. It's a factor. It's V quotiented by U, where U is a subspace of V. So, if you take one particular parallel translate or affine set or sometimes also called coset, okay, that is just this object. But what I am interested in looking at is the choice of all possible such parallel translates or cosets that are parallel to U. Okay, what is it that is so interesting and why should it interest us? Why should we be bothered with this object? Just to give you some intuition, <clears throat> once again, I'll use some figures. I'll draw the 2D and 3D. <coughs> so suppose this is the X, Y, Z, all right, and Again, let's say this is U passing through the origin, all right? Just assume it's passing through the origin. I mean, I can't do anything better than that other than to ask you to assume. So this is U. Now, very, very important. Suppose this U is not exactly, you know, uh, just parallel to the Y axis in some sense. So that every time you translate this U, what are you going to get? I'm just going to ask you to try and imagine this scenario. You have the XYZ plane, uh, space, sorry, right? And you have a plane passing through the origin. And now you're translating that plane up and down or in you know, any, any possible direction. It's basically a translation. So every possible plane will cut the Y axis at some point or the other. The point where the y-axis perforates 
the parallel translate of u is a unique point, right? Now, if you keep doing that, of course, the subspace is the one that is passing through the origin. But any other non-subspace coset, yeah, they will just cut at different different points. So, do you immediately realize something interesting going on? How many such parallel translates can you draw? There are exactly as many, yeah, infinite for sure, but they are exactly corresponding to the number of points on the y axis. And if I had y, y axis, choose any other line that perforates this plane. And along that line, every point corresponds to a corresponds to a fellow such as this. So, this entire set is as numerous exactly containing as many members as the number of points in a straight line. Here is how I would like to set your thought process in motion. This u when it passes through the origin is a subspace of dimension 2. The entire ambient dimension is 3. And now, if you think a little deeply about this, it turns out that this fellow, if it has a vector space structure, we do not know that yet. We have to define addition and multiplication yet. But if it has a vector space structure, it seems like it is one dimensional. Is it not? Because you see, for every such parallel translate, you are exactly come up with one point. So, there seems to be a one to one on to correspondence with a particular straight line that is one dimensional. Now, think about the second example, which is again 3D. Let us say this time this is x, this is y, and this is z. And now, let us say this is my straight line, and this is my u. So, a straight line through the origin is also a subspace, right? What do you think are parallel translates of this straight line? They are not planes, they are also going to be individually looking like the straight line after all. All parallel translates of a particular object look like the object itself. So, what are basically all these other <coughs> parallel translates of this that is objects like these? They are just you know other straight lines shifted from the origin but parallel to this straight line. Now, each of those parallel lines perforates a particular point on the x y axis or uh, sorry x y plane. So, basically every point on the x y plane sort of corresponds to a unique object in this set which means again the theme sort of fits. You have the three dimensional vector space, three dimensional Euclidean space in which you have a one dimensional subspace and how numerous are the parallel translates of that one dimensional subspace, you have exactly a one to one correspondence with the two dimensional subspace that is x y plane or any plane for that matter. The x y plane I have again chosen for convenience just like I chose the y axis there. But the point is if you are if you are already imagining this picture, it seems like if you know that the overall parent spaces dimension is something and if you know that this subspaces dimension is something, it seems that the dimension of this assuming it is a vector space, we have not done that yet, I am just trying to give you some intuition, assuming this is a dimension, uh, is a vector space, its dimension seems to be like the difference between these two, seems to intuitively fall in place, right? But again, we have a few miles to go before that, we have to at least establish whether this is a vector space, what is the addition if it is a vector space and so on and so forth. So, we have to explore certain properties, but just keep this intuition in mind. We will revisit this and formally prove this not just for Euclidean spaces, but for general vector spaces. Very shortly we will do that. Sorry? Uh, well, you look at this. So, every point on the x y plane, x y plane is two dimensional. So, every point on the x y plane corresponds to one member in this set. So, that means this set has as many objects as the number of objects in a two dimensional vector space. So, it should be at least as numerous, there must be a 
isomorphism, at least we expect there will be an isomorphism with a two dimensional vector space. And this is a one dimensional vector space, the ambient is 3, so 3 minus 1, 2, right. So we can expect it to, I mean it is a good guess is what I am saying. Again, lot of things to be done here, this is a very semi formal way of approaching this as of now, right, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to start with a subspace. U is al always a subspace. So these are parallel translates of a subspace, which are these affine sets or these cosets, right? So now we will probe a very important property of these cosets or affine sets. We will see that if you know this argument that we sort of motivated towards the beginning, like two people coming up with two different vectors v and they eventually merge and collapse onto the same affine set. So whose is the better one, right? So it turns out it will matter not as to which way you are describing this. Either description goes. You can as well make peace with your friend. So that's the, that's the message. So what is the point? The point is the equivalence of these three conditions. The fact that V minus W belongs to u, okay, let me just write that down formally here. The following are equivalent. What are these? Then v plus u is equal to w plus u and thirdly v plus u intersection w plus u is not an empty set which if you interpret a little closely suggests the two affine sets are either parallel to one another or they are exactly the same as one another. There is nothing else. You cannot have two affine sets that have something in common but not everything in common. You cannot have partial overlap. Either they are completely non-touching and disjoint. If they are not disjoint then they must be the same, right? That is what this claim would apparently imply. Yeah, I forgot to put the bracket. Thank you. Right. <coughs> All right. So how do we go about proving this? Okay. So here is how we will go about this proof. When you have these equivalent sort of proofs, sometimes these are handy ways of doing it show the equivalence of, instead of showing each one's equivalence to each of the other two, show that this implies this, this implies this and this implies this and you are done. Yeah, it is a cycle of reasoning, all right. So first, suppose V minus W belongs to U. Right. Now let an object, look, we already know that this is a set, yeah, it is a set containing vectors inside the vector space V, yeah. So suppose V minus W is sitting inside, let mm, V hat belong to V plus u implies there exists u1 in u such that v hat is equal to u1 plus v, clear? That is the definition. If something belongs to this, objects like this, it means that there is some object inside the subspace u which when added to this vector v results in the vector inside that set, right? 
But now, what can we say? V minus W belongs to U. So, what am I going to replace this with? What do you think this is going to be? Can I not write this as U1 plus V minus W plus W? Why? Why am I writing it in this weird fashion? Because I have to use whatever has been given to me. And what has been given to me is the fact that this belongs to you. So this entire object, let me use a different color. So this entire object then belongs to what? You. Because this object belongs to you by my proposition here. And this object obviously belongs to you as I have assumed it to. So therefore this is some u hat plus w, sorry. So this is some u hat plus w, where of course this u hat belongs to you. So then this obviously belongs to what? This belongs to? Right, w plus u. I started with something that belongs in v plus u and I notice that it must belong to w plus u. Therefore, v plus u must be contained inside w plus u, right? Can I go about it the other way? Anything prevents me from doing that? Nothing whatsoever, yeah? I mean just start with an object that belongs to <coughs> excuse me w plus u therefore it is some w plus some u2 right and then at some point look this is after all a subspace so if this belongs to u then w minus v also belongs to u <coughs> because u is closed under addition and the additive inverse of any vector inside u must also be in u right so this means basically w minus v also belongs there so it's just flipping the argument so you complete that argument to also infer that w plus u is contained inside v plus u and combining these two you have v plus u is equal to w plus u. So the first one implying the second is done. Uh, is there anything to prove in so far as the second one implying the third goes? Well, they are same. So their intersection is either of them. Yeah, can't be five. We are not interested in the trivial subspace, right? So obviously, this is also done. So this is done. This is done. The only thing that we then require to show is this. This connection is what we have to establish, right? So how do we establish this? If indeed as claimed that this is a non-empty, therefore there is some common fellow sitting inside both of these, right? So there exists P such that P is equal to V plus U1 and P is equal to W plus U2 with U1 and U2 belonging to U, right? This is because P belongs to V plus U and this is because P belongs to W plus U, <coughs> right? So what does this imply? staring us in the face, is it not? So V plus U1 is equal to W plus U2 implying V minus W is equal to U2 minus U1. But what is U2 minus U1? If U1 and U2 belong to U, then U2 minus U1 must also belong to 
this U, which is really nothing but this connection. So all of these three results or these three propositions are one and the same, equivalent. And now, do you see why this implies that either two of those affine sets are either completely disjoint or they're identical to one another, there's nothing in between, right? So this actually is good because this allows us to extend the notion of what is parallelism. See, parallelism is just something that we understand intuitively, but here, when you're talking about these affine sets, they may not be from Euclidean space whatsoever, but yet you can talk about them being parallel. When there's nothing that is there in common between them, then they're completely distinct and they're parallel. And they're parallel precisely to a subspace, an object that we recognize, a subspace that is sitting inside V, right? And it is this, this result that allows us to do all the algebra that we want to with these quotient spaces. Because in the absence of this, we wouldn't know whether when we are defining these additions and scalar multiplications on objects in this vector space, whether they even make sense or not, right? So that is the next object we shall now study, which is how to define vector addition and scalar multiplication in the quotient space, thereby rendering it with a vector space structure, right? Any questions up until this point so far?